Let's talk about the paranormal. It's a fascinating subject. I think so. Full of controversy. Let me introduce you first. But first, let me okay. introduce you. Um, hello. Hello. This is my friend, Sam Costanzo, and me, Carrie Hayes. And we're the co-hosts of Angry Dead Women. Right. So, Sam. <laughs> Okay, how did you become interested in the paranormal? Oh, it just always fascinated me. I mean, I don't ghost hunt or anything like that. But, you know, I, I read a lot of articles on it, watch a lot of uh, TV. I mean, there's there's plenty of shows on the Travel Channel, things like that, that talk about this stuff. But when you were a kid, did you see something that frightened you? Or <laughs> you believe that you, you've seen... Well, uh, I mean, I've saw two or three flying objects. In that, Poughkeepsie? I, don't, I mean, I don't know if that's considered paranormal or not, probably. In Poughkeepsie? Um, East Fishkill, all three of them where I lived, in Hopewell Junction area. So, uh, well, you want to hear about that? I mean, one one of them was, yes. uh, I was dri my father was driving, I was a, probably teenager, 16, 17 years old, something like that. My dad was mm -hmm. driving and we were heading south on Route 376. And I saw this, we both saw it at the same time. It was a silver disc tipped on a 30 degree angle. And it was hopscotching across the sky over the mountain. And I'm like, it was like, it was like a rock skipping over water. What time of day was this? Oh, it was, I don't, it was during the day. I don't remember morning. It was daylight then. Oh, it was daylight. And it both caught our eye and we looked at each other and go, did you see that? And he goes, yeah, I did. <laughs> so that was the first one. The second one, I was driving on Route 84, uh, just past um, uh, Fishkill Correctional facility, the, the jail, mm -hmm. Route 84, I'm heading east, and it was late at night, I'm pro probably 12 midnight, 11 o'clock, something like that. 84 is the direction of Connecticut when you're going east, yes, right? Yes, going towards, yeah, okay. I just I just made it over the Beacon Newburgh Bridge, mm -hmm. heading, continuing east, heading home, and I looked up, and it was a very starry night, very starry night except for this triangle black huge thing that was like slowly passing over me on route 84. So I stopped, I pulled the car over and I Onto got the out shoulder. of the car. Uh, on route 84, I got out of the On car. The I, no, no, it's uh, 84 is uh, just an interstate and it's not the throughway. But it's still a pretty big road, no? Oh, it's a busy road. It's a busy road, but the shoulder was wide. Okay. But this caught this caught my attention, so I pulled the car over, got out of the car, and I'm looking straight up, and couldn't see too much definition. But it was huge and black, and solid triangle, and it was quiet, and it was just gliding over me, and I. Um, was you know what was weird was I didn't find myself getting excited over it. So after it passed over me, I just got in the car, drove home. Now you would think, now I was living with my parents at the time. I was still, you know, 19 maybe, mm -hmm. 18, 19. You would think when you got home, I'd wake my parents up, you know, mom, dad, look, look what I, you know, I guess what I, I didn't, I went right to bed. Yeah. And then we got up the next morning having breakfast around the table, and uh, I just casually mentioned it to my father. I said, "Hey, you know what I saw last night?" And uh, he, you know, he listened, and he's he was kind of interested in this stuff too. So, but that was the end of it. I um, didn't take it any further, but it always stuck in my head. 
what I saw. Now, there was always controversy in the area at the time. Um, people were seeing a triangle thing with lights. Right. And uh, they were writing it off 57? to... You were born in 1957? Yeah, 57. So yep. This is like 1976, 77. Late seventies, early eighties, it okay. was. Okay. Eight, and um, so there was a controversy with, um, or they were saying that there were um, um, pilots in the area that were flying with their engines off and their lights on in a formation just to spoof people. Mm -hmm. But I didn't believe that in this case because you can't write off the fact that this thing was solid. I saw it, it was solid. Right. So if it was a triangle, you would see right through it, right? I mean, did you just... ever compare notes with anyone about this? No, 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 no. But there were lots of reports of this at the time, a triangle thing. Really? Yeah, yeah. I saw, I just happened to see it that night. It's pretty And freaky. lastly, now the last thing that I saw was I was driving same road, Route 84, mm -hmm. heading east. Mm -hmm. And um, the IBM plant, is to your left and i saw this uh solid shiny sphere like a large balloon mm -hmm. except and but the balloon was going up and down right over the plant i could see it from a distance it's going like this and i'm like what the heck <laughs> oh, what the heck is that and then uh, i didn't pull over i didn't stop or nothing and i just i just continued driving but uh those were my th three now they call them uaps not UFOs. what does uap mean unidentified aerial phenomena ah uh, right wow so um wow. so that, that, those were my three that i saw and that was that and then you haven't witnessed any since um I did, but I, I'm I'm not sure what it was. So, um, sitting at a restaurant in um, in Poughkeepsie, which is right on the Hudson River, mm -hmm. with my family, and I'm looking south, right down the river, because it was a beautiful evening, starry night. Right. Again, a starry night. Right. And, and your kids I were with you this these... time. What? Your kids were with you this time. One of them were. Okay. And um, I see, of the stars, I see three extraordinarily bright ones. And if you look at those bright ones, they were in a triangle. But it was nothing more than just three dots that were very bright. And I didn't think anything of it. I figured, okay, it's a coincidence. You know, it's just three extraordinarily bright stars. And I didn't say anything to my family because they probably think I'm nuts anyway. And I, <laughs> right. I mean, had you shared with Patty at this point that yes, in the past you had seen your UAP? Yeah, she knows. She knows okay. I've seen them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then as I'm staring at these three lights, all of a sudden, one at a time, in order from left to top to bottom, they go out. One, two, three. Done. Last I saw of it. And that was last year. What? Yeah. 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 So I don't know what, don't know what it was. It so, wasn't solid. And then in the meantime, sorry, I'm, I'm drinking tea here, but my husband has always um, posed the following question, and I'm sure he's not the first person to pose this question. Why is it the majority of these encounters take place in places like South Dakota? You know, these deserted, long, abandoned roads, basically in the middle of nowhere, when you would think that an alien who has the wherewithal to come to our solar system, to come to our orbit and to, to land on Earth, would think nothing of, like, getting to New York City. It's a good question. And I would counter, well, I would add to this, that why would they even crash? <laughs> when you think of it. Right. They, they travel, you know, however they got here, whether they're right. in a different dimension or millions mm -hmm. of miles and mm -hmm. they crash. <laughs> Think about so, it. So, I mean, 
Are we just being fed a bunch of nonsense? Are we just some aspiring conspiracy theorists who are just like dying uh, to get in there and say it's a whole, you know, huge? I, I don't thing? know. See that that that's the that's the compelling thing about this is you could look at it either way, and you can believe it either way. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, now they say, it was said many, many years ago that in the year 2025, they will reveal themselves. Did Nostradamus say that? No, no, it guy? wasn't. Gene Dixon? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't remember the, uh, the source of it. But Tennessee Claflin, maybe? <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. No, That's um, pretty crazy stuff. But, you know, I got to believe it because there is so much excitement and now transparency that's going on in the, on this subject. And the government now has, you know, is right. taking this more seriously. Right. You got to wonder, hey, you know, maybe in two years, one and a half years, that something will be said about it. Who knows? I don't I know. Think, I well, think they probably just don't want to be bested by social media. You know what I mean? Like. They should well, find the aliens, not Facebook. Well, well, think about it. I think the concern might be, let's say for the for argument's sake, that yeah. that's true, that there there are aliens. Okay. And and perhaps one of the theories is is our DNA was kind of, you know, where we're, we've been harvested. Already? That's one of the theories. Have we yeah. already been harvested? Maybe, perhaps we've we've been those people living in those rural places, the ones who went up and had a probe from the the aliens. You mean those? Oh, the well, they're thinking from? that you know they've extracted our DNA and they've done you know they're they're harvesting some of us uh -huh. with them. You know, well anyway, but but let's say that's all true for a minute. Now, just okay. imagine the um, the religious implications behind this. You know, what will people think? Oh, sure, right. Well, you know the the, the Catholics, the Jews. just the whole, the whole religious, the whole thing. It's so, like, yeah, yeah. It's going to tip everything. It's going to screw everything up. My guest today is Ms. Carrie Cathers. She is a historian, a copy editor, an expert on medieval warfare a scholar of nefarious criminology from the 19th century forward, also a little bit in the 18th century. She uh, has written extensively about the use of arsenic, belladonna, and other means of poisoning people you just dislike. Carrie, welcome to my show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So I'm going to just be really close to my um, microphone so that whatever issues I had before, I won't be having again. And okay. I just wanted to ask you, how is it you got involved with the dark side? I, it's always been a little bit there with me. From even when I was a kid, I remember just seeing the, the odd side of things and the darker side of things. Um, and I think a little bit of it is trying to figure out why some people see, you know, go that way and will do things. So A Curiosity of Crime, that's your blog, yes. which focuses okay. on specific aspects of misdeeds. Yes. Tell me about how, how, how you contrived that or conceived that. Uh, it began in... Um, an interview with a gentleman, Edward Adich, who is a forensic, with the F Toronto Police Forensics Department, and writing an article thinking about, you know, the whole question about what do people in forensics think about fiction and television shows with forensics. And a comment right. was made about there being no forens historical forensics, you know, past about the mid 1900s. And then I had read a quote about that. And I thought, this can't be, there's got to be something. So I started reading um, true crime books and other history books and found like a whole wealth of it. And I enjoy historical fiction when it's done well. And, um, and by that, I mean when it's holding true enough to the history that it's, it's believable. You can't see much of the present day in it. And right. I thought, well, 
you know, people are looking for this information. I am an avid, avid reader. Why don't I combine my two loves of crime or my three loves, crime, fiction, and research and bring them together? Right. Yeah. Do, do historical mystery thriller people seek you out to consult? I've, I had, um, I, it began with an uncertainty as to whether or not there would be a demand for this. But what I found is everywhere I go where there are people who are writing crime fiction, there are questions, there's an interest, there are people who are, you know, can I do this? Can they do that? What was there? What wasn't there? And right. I'm finding that, yes, there are people who are sending me emails saying, I've got this situation. Is it possible to do this? And, you know, and so do they become clients or is everything pro bono? At the moment, it's in kind of the liminal area. What I'm going to be doing is once um, the new website, the Substack gets going, is setting up consultations. And I'm going to also be doing, um, if people send in questions to, you know, just do like little video quips of, you know, here's what this is or here's the answer to that. So at the moment, oh, we're in you the should check out this platform. Video. If you yeah. can master this platform. <laughs> Yeah, it might take me a You'll year. You'll be able to have your own YouTube channel. <laughs> and as long as I don't break YouTube, I can just see that message coming up saying, sorry, everybody, but Carrie Cather's just... Right, the spinning YouTube. wheel of death. <laughs> could not upload, could not upload. <laughs> They're going to put that on my grave, like on my tombstone. This right. Right. No, but that's so interesting. So people will be able to send you a query and then you'll just answer it on the air. Like yes. car talk. Do you remember car talk that was on public radio for many years? Maybe you didn't have it in um, Canada. Yeah, a little bit. It was mostly when we were visiting the States. Yeah. Well, it was a much loved show here and people would have questions about their cars. And these two men who really were, they, their chemistry was such they could have been stand up comedians. They would answer you know, whether the car should be repaired or whether the car should be sold or whether, you know, the, the, the part was, was salvageable. And it was really marvelous. And the fact that so much fiction involves some nefarious deed or misdeed, yes. Yes. that really the possibilities I would think are endless for you. Yeah. And I think even because um, people were saying, are there limitations? And I see the limitations as just um, you know, like the human imagination, you know, if right. a writer can pick something up and coming in and it's like, um, you know, is it able to do it? But what I found I've done is because with history and having done studying the history, there's very much a line like, you know, we've got this document, you can't. But what I like doing is going in and saying, okay, you know, here's where it is, but here's how you can play with this to make this right. possible. If you set up this source or this knowledge or create this element of your, your villain, you know, here's yes. how it can be done. And I find that, so the, the imagination, I think there's always a way of working it into what the reality was or shifting the reality. Right. To, you know, to fit, right. Yeah. So I think, yeah. Now tell me about the novel you've been working on. Cause all, well, all this is going on. You've also been working on a novel. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's tentatively called The Key because it's about a key and I'm yes. very bad at titles and coming up with them. <laughs> and <laughs> so I just thought, hey, we'll call it The Key. And it, right, that's it, straightforward it, enough. Yeah, and it got its inspiration and it kind of was one of those that percolated. I was doing research about crime in New York and the vast majority of crime, we all look at the murders, but the vast majority is, is theft and robbery. And I was yes. reading a section of it where like the, the robbers are, or the thieves are specialized. So if you're a pickpocket, right. you're not a safe cracker. And they were telling a story about how people, especially women, would sit in very high-end hotel room or hotels, scope out a pa uh, patron, follow them to their room. And then when they went down for breakfast or went down for dinner, they would slip up, pick the lock, steal everything, relock it, and then run away. And I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting scenario if you went in and you stole something and then, you know, it was something that you shouldn't have stolen. That, you and know, also the, the mark always, or the victim always presumed it was the hotel staff, right? Yeah. They and always they thought it was the servants had, or the cleaning people. Yeah. And also they had, when they went down to explain it, because the lock had been picked and then relocked, 
this um, hotel staff didn't always believe that they had been robbed because it wasn't that they trashed the place. It was, you know, the way they had, you know, the way they left is the way they went in. So they would always yes. think that these people were just trying to get out of paying their bills. So it of course led to wonderful scenarios. So, so that was the premise or the basis oh my goodness. of the book. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so there was something I wanted to ask feet. you about also, Jane, of um, something rather lame. We were talking about that poor, unfortunate servant girl. Yeah, was, and I was uh, thinking with, with that, no, we can talk about that. But I've also, I, I had to think about women, you know, angry dead women and women who would yes. be, you know, that we should think about that are little known. And I came up, if I might, with two, but they're both under the same umbrella. One is um, Milieva uh, Maric, who married Albert Einstein. And was a brilliant, oh, right. apparently the first smarter Mrs. Einstein. Than, than him. And so thinking, yes. you know, here's a woman in academia, smarter than her husband. And even today, they will not acknowledge that she had anything to do. So that must have really, really annoyed her that he gets all this attention and she's basically right. blanked out. And the right. other one who was in the same situation is Margaret Roper. Now, she was Margaret Moore, who was the daughter or the, the eldest child and the daughter of Sir Thomas More, one of the great intellectual minds of Europe in the 16th century. He knew, or he was right. um, associated Who was martyred. With the Sir Thomas More, who was martyred. Yes. And he knew okay. Erasmus. And his eldest daughter was brilliant. They wrote, or he set up a competition between the two of them, because they were very close, to write, and each would write a book, The Four Last Things, and it was a theological book. So four separate subjects. She finished first and she showed him her book. And we only know about the existence of this book from her writing, you know, from her father's writing. And I think a couple of other people have mentioned it. And Thomas More writes about how he read this, was so moved. It was so intellectually and spiritually superior to his that he never finished his book and he burned both of them. He burned his in shame because he, hers was so much better and he burned hers because for a woman to publish her own scholarly ideas in the 1500s in England would have brought the family to complete and utter ruin. So here we have this woman who sat and probably talked with Erasmus and developed all of this intellect and she was silenced because it wasn't seen as proper. Yeah. And it's, it's so, you know, when they say about these minds, like here was probably one of the greatest intellectual and spiritual minds of Europe of the time, silenced. And the only writings we have of her are the translations she did. So she spoke Latin, she spoke Greek, she spoke French fluently. And what happened to so, her after her father's death? Uh, she was, um, and this is, this is how attached and perhaps a little bit too attached to her father. She bribed the executioner or the individual who dealt with the head after it was removed. She took it home. She pickled it and she died. I think it was eight or nine years after her father in a marriage that was a little bit tumultuous. And then her so husband she brought, she brought her father's know, head home, yep, pickled, pickled it, it and then kept it at the house. Kept it at the house. Or did she bury and her it? Her husband, after she died, kept it as well, and it's buried with him. With her husband. <laughs> with the husband. <laughs> we talk about like you know, like the Real Housewives of Orange County. It's like let's just go to the Real Housewives of 16th century London. <laughs> but I think with that is just this this whole intellect that we've lost. And again, maybe questionable, like that might be a sign of her genius to go, I must have my dad's head and put it on the oh mantle. My oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that just conjures so many images of the dinner party. When you know, it's like, uh, you know, cause now we have like, they're in, well, the ashes was he are kept in the, in the cupboard or was he put on the mantle? I, I think that he was kept out, like perhaps not display for public, but I think probably somewhere where it could be it could be seen, I would assume. I don't know for certain, but that would be my assumption. That would be my delight. The fact that, you know, she's got daddy's head on display, you know, with the children and the guests. Daddy is here with us. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. That was worth its price of admission. (laughs) (laughs) How come that never comes up when people talk about Thomas More? Never, never. No, no, he was just martyred, end of the story. Daughter kept him in a pickling jar. Wow. (laughs) So um, earlier today, I learned about the, um, there's a, a human foot or something like that, that's kept in Canada in a bucket of liquor and people go and have a sip of that liquor. Do you know about this? Oh, I don't know about that. I know that in British Columbia, there have been random feet in shoes showing up on the beaches. um, No, no, this is kept in a bar. This is like some human body part, like a toe is kept in a vat of vodka or something like that. And I want to say it's not in Newfoundland, but somewhere like that. But I haven't heard about somebody, that, but I know. Somebody was passing the link around, but I was too busy with my tech details, you know, trying to figure out microphones and screens and cameras and why was I sounding like I came from Rangoon. And so I I wasn't able to fully attend that part of the conversation. But isn't that something? We've gone from one body part to another. To All another. in the name you... of just talking about misdeeds. That's right. <laughs> My goodness. So when when are you going to have your sub stack open for business? I'm hoping first week of September because I've got a number of things in place. It's just the two things I have to do is just double check everything right? and then get over my fear of things being released into the wild on the Internet. Don't be afraid. Don't yes. be afraid because the, the world, by and large, is incredibly indifferent. So you can have all kinds of things go wrong and no one will really notice. So, and, this is and it could be preserved for, for in, in perpetuity, but you'll be able to laugh about it later. <laughs> or you can talk about it on, on, um, on a chat show later or something like that or a show like this. And you could say, oh, when I tried to do my Substack the first time. But here's the, here's the question. What is your Substack going to be called, Carrie, so that people can find you? It's called, um, oh, Bandit's Roost. And it Bandit is from- Roost, R-O-O-S-T? S-T, yes. Okay. And it's Bandit's taken from Roost. a picture that was taken in the 1800s in New York. So I- Oh, uh, and, you, and had it on your, you had it on your blog, didn't you? Blog, the Curiosity yes. of Crime with the guys right. just hanging about? Then sitting in the, the little alley, yes. And you can just okay. see that it was where no police okay. officer would go. So, so I it's going to be banditsroost.substack.com or something like yes. that, or substack.banditsroost.com. And then that's yes. how they'll find you or else they find you at Curiosity of Crime because you will be posting about that on your blog so yes. that people can be, find you. Is that right? Yeah. And I'll be putting a link in uh, once it's up and going. I'll be putting the link on the website as well to take everybody to Bandits Roost because that's, I think, where I'm going to be putting most of the activity and most of the... Um, the postings are on Bandit's Roost. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll cross post here too and on, on, on my thing as yeah. well. Carrie Cathers. <laughs> this is Carrie Hayes saying thank it's you so very much indeed. indeed.